We tried to have children, couldn't have children, did IVF for two and a half years. Literally, I'm on the road driving back and forth because where I lived was so far out in the boonies that I oh, literally wow. had to drive four hours oh. away to be able to go and see an IVF doctor. Oh yeah, we did this for two and a half years. I was on in rest stops, injecting myself. <laughs> oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. And none of it worked. No, it never worked. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the How Do You Medicine podcast, where we talk to healthcare professionals doing medicine their way. And so I'm your host, Dr. Nancy Joseph, aka The Dynamic Doc. And today with us, we have a special guest, Dr. Renee Volney Darko, which I'll call Dr. Darko for this episode. So Dr. Darko is a board certified obstetrics and gynecologist. But before that, she started her um, academic career, post-secondary academic career at Pace University, where she got her bachelor's of science in biology. And then she went on to get an MBA at Rockhurst University um, and then got her doctorate in osteopathic medicine, a deal such as myself. <laughs> at um, Kansas City University Medicine um, of, of Medicine and Biosciences. Um, then she did residency in OBGYN, like we mentioned, and that was at UMDNJ Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Mm -hmm. So she, as, again, I said, is an OBGYN um, by training, but as if that wasn't enough, currently she's a mom. She's an adjunct clinical professor at Morehouse. She's a blogger. She's a chief operating officer. She's a founder and CEO and all of these things. So we would get into all of the many hats she wears and how she does medicine and talk about her journey on today's podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Darko. Thank you, thank you. I should say that my LinkedIn, probably the only thing that isn't up to date there is that I am no longer at Morehouse School of Medicine, but everything oh. else was on point. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, so yeah, so we'll, so that was, she, she was prior, um, she was yeah. an adjunct Professor, yep. professor. Yeah. But so welcome, welcome. So Willie, let's start in the beginning. So first of all, I have my osteopathy shirt on today. Um, limited edition made by my school at Ohio University. Love so it, love it. Let's talk about osteopathy, right? A lot of people don't even know, you know, some people may say Dr. Such and such or Dr. Such and such DO, but you know, many don't even know what osteopathy is, much less what a DO is. So can you talk to us a little bit about what that even is? Absolutely. So DO, Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine, um, is basically one of the two types of full-fledged practicing doctors that there are in the United States. And um, it, is a, it is a branch of medicine that is focused on a philosophy, right, of four tenets, that the body is a unit, the body has the ability to heal itself, structure affects function, and vice versa, and that any good type of treatment is basically based on the first three tenets that I just mentioned. Oftentimes people think that, you know, osteopathic medicine is just working with your hands. Um, and the reality is that's just one treatment and evaluation modality, right? So I often, you know, I work with pre-meds. So I often will tell pre-meds um, that don't think about osteopathic medicine as just, well, I'm just going to start working with my hands but more of this, you know, really comprehensive view of patients because working with your hands is similar to, you know, using a stethoscope um, and or even if you're talking about treatment, providing, you know, a prescription. So you can evaluate with your hands, but you can also treat with your hands, but that's not where osteopathic medicine um, starts and stops. Perfect, yep, and then, um, you know, there may be some out there who you mentioned your pre-med uh, pre strategies. That you, so we'll talk all about that. But there may be someone who is thinking about applying to medicine or in the process of applying to um, medical school and is choosing between being, you know, going to DO school or going to what is commonly referred to allopathic school or MD school. Is, um, right. How do you, how did you make your decision? So I... It's funny because when I first um, encountered osteopathic medicine, I had no clue, like many people, that it even existed. Um, and so as I started to read more, you know, look up things on the internet, I started meeting 
um, osteopathic students as well as osteopathic physicians, I realized that for me, the philosophy just made sense, right? It just made sense. Like I look at patients like that, right? I think, yeah, the body is a unit. The body does have an ability to heal itself, you know, like structure does affect function. And if I'm going to be a great doctor, then yeah, I should have these things in my mind at all times. Um, I did apply both MD and DO because at the end of the day, I, I just wanted to be a doctor. But once I had my pick of the litter because I got accepted to both MD and DO schools, then I had, to, I had a real decision to make. Um, and so for me, because I really... Um, that philosophy resonated with me so much, I decided to go to a DO school. Um, and that's how I ended up at Kansas City University. Perfect. And do you, do you feel like, how do you feel like that shaped you as a physician? Oh, I think it's definitely shaped me. I mean, it really allows me to see my patients from this very comprehensive point of view, you know, and I'm, I, you know, I've, I have not had an MD education, so I can't say, you know, that one is better than the other. But what I can say is that because it resonated with me in the past, because I knew the type of doctor I wanted to be, the type of relationships that I wanted to have with my patients, I can say it has definitely a hundredfold helped me to, to bring that to fruition. Um, you know, when I when I see a patient, I don't just see the issue that they're bringing to me. You know, I see all the things, right? I see everything um, surrounding uh, this this issue that they might be having, and that might be, you know, their their mental health. Um, that might be their support system at home. You know, it might be other things, you know, other desires that they might have, other activities that they might be involved in. And so I'm an, you know, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, right? So I deal with menstrual cycles and, you know, pregnant women and older right. women and menopause and things like that. And mm -hmm. it's very easy to get tunnel visioned on one thing. But I feel like my education has allowed me to just see way more so that I can help people um, not just, you know, with their medical issues, but allowing them to navigate through their medical issues, even within their social construct. Right. And that's very um, powerful because a lot of people are looking for that level of like comprehensive medicine and comprehensive mm -hmm. care and caring more about them as a whole. Right? right. In general, I think us, us as human beings, we want to be um, not only viewed as, but cared for. As right. whole human beings, because that's real, that's where we are. Yeah. Um, so let's get into. So here you are. You're you're so right now. You're a physician, but at one point you were a high school teacher. Yeah, I was. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Was that like you know what? what so what happened? Your journey? <laughs> did you did you? I mean, which teachers are phenomenal. Teachers are a necessity, definitely essential in our society, but. I want you to hear your journey, how you became a high school teacher. Yeah, that was never in the plan. That was right. actually never in the plan. Um, that was literally a fluke. So when, so I did go to Pace University. Um, about two years later, I started doing post back courses at Hunter College. Once I started doing that, you know, my schedule was kind of, you know, a little bit difficult to manage in terms of work. And so I started doing work at all these different places because, you know, I needed part-time work to be able to go to school. Um, one of the one of the places that I worked was actually at a high school. I started out as a tutor, as a math tutor, um, tutoring two or three students um, in math, like they were juniors in high school. And they all ended up doing very well on their Regents exams, which is a, a New York state exam um, that students take. Well, after that, the vice principal at the time came to me and said, hey, listen, I'd like for you to, to teach here. And I was like, well, I'm planning on going to med school, so I don't know how that's going to work. teach it, right. Yeah, you know, and so, I, but I had a year, I had a year to apply because I finished off my post back courses and that year I was going to be applying. So I needed a full-time job. Um, and he said, no, I think you'd be great. At first, he tried to pawn me off on the middle school. And I was like, I don't like middle school children. I'm going to just tell you this right now. So <laughs> he was like, all right, all right. He was like, all right, I got you. I got you. 
So he, you know, he eventually said, listen, why don't you come into the high school and teach science there? And that's how I ended up teaching science. So in, in New York City, there's always a shortage, unfortunately, of math and science teachers. And so because I had a biology degree, I actually qualified to be what they call a permanent substitute teacher, which basically means that there is no teacher um, for, okay. you know, for certain classes and that they needed someone permanently to substitute for that year. So I ended up teaching um, four classes that year, um, two freshman classes and two junior, senior mixed classes. Okay. And I uh, was teaching biology and physical sciences. So that was really, I mean, that was really exciting for me. And I will tell you, it helped me with medicine because it helped oh. me to realize that, you know, patient education and education in general are not different. Like you, you're educating someone. Um, and when you have the mind of children in front of you, you know, you have to, re you start to realize, wait a minute, they're foundational things that they don't know. And I have to teach them those things before I can go about the business of teaching them everything I know. And it's the same thing with patients, right? We can't assume that the patient has a level of knowledge um, that they might not have. So we have to assess, right? Do an assessment and figure out what does this patient know? Once we figure out what this patient knows, then we can go about telling them, okay, this is what you need to know for, you know, your current situation. So kind of meet yeah. them where they are type of thing. Right. Meet them where they are. Like when exactly. I know where you are, I can kind of know, okay, what direction we should go and things like that. Exactly. Um, yeah. Fun year though. Let me tell you. So that was pre, so it's pre-med school. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. Like pre mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. That That's, you know, being able to um, live a, a full life that allows you different experiences from what you can pull to be, Different thing, you know, you you never know where you can learn, like, mm -hmm. life-serving lessons and yes. things that will kind of, like, help in general. So yeah. then let's jump back into, now you're OBYN, but what's interesting in how you do medicine is that you do something called locum tenens. Yeah. So those who, for those who don't know, like, we affectionately in the medical community call them locums. Mm -hmm. So what is locum tenens and how did you even choose that to be your your frame to be an obstetrics and gynecologist. Oh yeah, so <laughs> so locum tenens basically is a Latin word for placeholder. That's what okay. it means. Okay. So it teach us today. Yeah, we. I, I'm a. I'm a teach y'all. You know, because I was a yeah. teacher. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> teachers be teaching. You right. You right. Teachers be right. Teaching. Teachers be teaching. So locum tenens means placeholder, which basically means that where there is no doctor. You, you you bring someone in to hold their place. So it's almost like substituting, right? And you full can- Full circle. That's right, full circle. So you can, again, you can do a locum's position where literally someone is just going on vacation and you, you know, supply yourself to be able to take care of their patients. Or you literally could be a locum's person because they just don't have- a doctor there. And so you supply yourself, um, again, to take care of the patients in that practice or at that hospital. So that's what locums is. Now, the first time I encountered locums was actually as a resident. I had an attending who was talking to me um, in the clinic one day about how she covered years ago, how she had covered for these doctors. And I was like, what is she like? I had no clue what she was. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, and she's like, yes, this thing called locums. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So she explained that to me. So the inquisitive person that I am, I went home and I looked it up and I just started realizing, wow, like this locums thing is a, is a real thing. And the more I read about it, the more intrigued I, I got about it. And I realized, wait a minute, if I did locums, um, I could actually kind of sample the practices and the hospitals, you know, that I wanted to go to and or at least the type of medicine or the type of practice that I wanted to go into. Did I want to do a private practice? Did I want to do a hospital? Did I want to do a, a clinic? Like, what did I want to do? So I was the only resident in my class that graduated with no job. Yeah. No and job. What did, what, so what, and for, <laughs> for people who don't know, and yeah, nobody does that. 
Right. And residency, um, well, first of all, when residency, there's a program director and an associate program director. And as the name implies, their um, goal is to direct you, but more specifically to, um, you know, guide you through the process of residency and kind of like after, like like a mom or dad kind of, you know, guides you into college and make sure you like you're going to a, a college when you get out of uh, high school. Yeah. So does the program director like What's next for you? You got something next? Okay, great. So what did, what did your, uh, you know, associate program director, director, or chief, chief is kind of like, you know, a resident that then, you know, a senior resident that's kind of like an inter, like, an, like a, a bridge or a gap role. Um, what did they think? you just being like, no, 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 no job, no job. So this is where the Morehouse School of Medicine does come in. Right. So at one point when I was in my third year, so the year before I was going to graduate, I also realized that I wanted to do a, pol a health policy fellowship. And so I started applying for um, health policy programs um, around the country. And unfortunately, the one that I really wanted to go to was the Morehouse School of Medicine. They didn't know whether or not there was going to be funding that year. Um, so they told me, well, you know, maybe we'll have the program, maybe we won't. And I was like, ah, all right, that's fine. So when fourth year came and I learned about locums, I was like, you know what? I just want to kind of sample, you know, um, the type of practice that I might want to be in. I don't know if I want to be in a hospital setting. I don't know if I want to be in somebody's, you know, office or, or clinic or private practice. Um, so when I was asked, you know, so what are you going to do? I was like, yeah, I don't know. I'll just go to a hospital, maybe a practice, figure it out, do some locums there. And they, everybody looked at me like I had three heads. They were like, are you serious? Like, you don't have a job? I was like, no, 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 I don't have a job. Anyway, so fast forward, um, because the other thing I wanted was I didn't want to graduate on June 30th and start working on July 1st. I was like, you know what? I done did eight years. I need a break. Okay. <laughs> I had saved enough money and I was, you know, going back to live with my parents for just a short while. So I said, you know what, I'll take that month and I'll, I'll figure things out. I started up with a locums agency and we started doing some paperwork to get me out to Kansas City to go and do some locums there. And lo and behold, Morehouse School of Medicine's um, program calls me and they say, listen, the program did open up. We got the funding. What do you think? Would you like to come here? And I said, I will have everything that you need from me in the next 24 hours. And so I had all the paperwork in. They called me for an interview and I was able to go and move to Atlanta and do that fellowship. But had I had a job, I wouldn't have been able oh. to do it. I wouldn't have been able to back so out. So you already kind of, in a way, not even intentionally made space for opportunity. Yes. Yes. And yeah. I think a lot of things too, for our, you know, healthcare colleagues who may even know, you know, we hear this term all the time, burnout, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, I mean, now it's more of a buzzword, right. but before it was, it wasn't really named. Um, you know, Jensen Sarah says, once you name a beast, you can slay it. So before yeah. it wasn't really being slain, right? right? It was being right. not really talked about, but really felt obviously and being experienced. Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes from fatigue to burnout, a lot of people would have burnout, but we had no solutions to it. Exactly. And I think now we're embracing the thought of taking breaks more yeah. um, and doing kind of what you did with planning, of course. One of the things that listeners should be weird, Dr. Dr. said she saved money. That was right. It. She right. said she had, she didn't. I had a plan. Right. She, she really, she didn't do something traditional, right. but it was like, a plan with room for opportunities. Exactly. And that's, you know, important being like, you know what, I want to create a space for something mm -hmm. to evolve or something to happen. However, I also would like to eat. So right. I also save money. Yes, right. exactly. And I'll, I'll do. And I think what's important too, I can't remember what, what platform I heard it, but sometimes you have to kind of take a step back. Just like when you're um, running, you take a step back to go further. And oftentimes right. you have to take a step back because some people will be like, moving back in with my parents, nah. But, you know, yeah. Dr. Draco took a step back there in order mm -hmm. to like catapult forward and exactly. have the, you know, career she has now. And so you're currently um, the chief operating officer of something called Equal Access Health. Tell us what that is and um, why did, yeah. you, did you start that and why? 
So basically my husband and I started that. Um, and that's, that's our own locums agency. Okay. So when you work locums, one of the things that's really important is that you function as a business. And so you yourself become the business, right? So you're the business. So my husband and I started that originally just the two of us, um, and just, you know, going out doing different locums, you know, opportunities and things like that. And eventually we ended up getting a call from a hospital saying, hey, listen, actually the hospital that I used to work for permanently, because at, at one point in time I was a permanent um, doc, but we ended up getting a call saying, hey, listen, we need to supply docs, um, but we don't, you know, we don't have the structure to do that. And so I was like, well, I have a locums company and I can do that for you. <laughs> oh, they contacted you. So you already yeah. had the locums company and then did they contact you hoping you'd have other docs that they can hire? So the funny thing is that there was a local practice that wanted to do the the locums for them, that wanted to supply the docs for them. But because they were a bigger hospital system, you know, asking for docs, and then you had this local private practice, they couldn't figure out like just how to contract each doc separately. And the pra the entire practice didn't want to participate the in the locums, right? So, so you they couldn't be wanna... like, my practice will supply you. Correct. So they were like, well, if only three out of your five docs want to do it, then we can't, you, we can't basically contract with your entire practice. So they asked us, hey, can you pull these doctors into your agency and then supply them that way? And so we were like, yeah, sure. Uh, we did that for about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, yeah, it, it was an awesome experience. It was a lucrative experience for sure. Um, and, you know, after the three, three and a half years were done, they actually found some permanent docs to be able to take care of their needs. Oh. Um, so, but that is to go to show you that locums can last, you know, just as long as, you know, a hospital needs you. Um, so, so yeah, but that was a lucrative experience. It was a great experience. Um, so now we're just back down to myself and my husband. And we always talk about whether or not we want to do, you know, supply for other you know, hospitals still. Um, but we have some other ventures that we think would be um, much more fun, um, much less stressful and just, you know, easier to attain. So but we'll yeah. talk about those actually a little later. Stay tuned. <laughs> so what made you decide? So you, but that you already had the company where you just talked to one the hospital um, reached out to you. So what made you decide to even start a locums company, right? Because one thing that they don't really teach in medicine, and maybe the um, the uh, the landscape is changing now, mm -hmm. but one thing they don't treat in medicine is business, right? But yeah. you essentially came out of residency and you started, I mean, you know, the fellowship, but then became a businesswoman, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not like, but I mean, the good news is, of course, you have an MBA. But in general, <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't really learn business. So like what made you decide to start that business and what advice would you give to someone that's like, I, I kind of, I'm scared, but I want to start a business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one, you know, I got my MBA while I was in medical school. Oh. Um, so that definitely, you know, it, it, it helped me in that it piqued my interest in business. Right. And so when I started realizing, wait a minute, you know, I'm contracting myself out, then, you know, it was just kind of like, well, technically I'm a business. Now, if you contract yourself out and you become a business, the IRS sees you differently than if you're just, hey, it's Dr. Renee, you know? So that's what the impetus was. It was to be able to essentially get that tax benefit that the government gives to businesses. Um, because the government, you know, the, the government writes the tax code not for individuals, they write the tax code to benefit businesses. And so that's why I ended up starting, um, you know, the business. My husband and I ended up starting the business because we realized, wait, we're going to be losing way too much money as individuals just doing this as, you know, kind of like a-, a How did you leadership. even get the word out, both about your business, but just as um, like, okay, so you, now you're out of the fellowship. Did you just happen to have connections because, they get, you know, from people that did residency with you? Um, to say, hey, look, you know, I am free to do, you know, individual contracts with these different hospitals or, 
Was it just like happenstance? So in this case, when I first started out, I actually started out with a locum's agency. Oh, that's right. So there are agencies. Yeah, there are agencies that you can use to be able to kind of dip your toe in the water and they walk you through. This is how you get an assignment with a local hospital or not even a local hospital. It could be a hospital anywhere. Um, I ended up doing an assignment, actually a long term assignment in Idaho at one point. Um, great place, by the way. Um, but, you know, you once you learn that landscape of locums, then, yeah, you you start to get a little more confident in that. Wait a minute. I could probably do this myself. And so you start, you know, contacting hospitals. You know, there are lists of hospitals that are always looking for physicians. So, yeah. So you could, you know, you could say, listen, I see that you're looking for a permanent position physician, but I could potentially be that placeholder for you while you are looking and I can take care of these patients so that you're, you know, that 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 place is filled um, while, sure. while you're looking. Yeah. Got mm -hmm. you. Got you. Got you. And you mentioned that you started your, um, like this, this is something, a joint thing you have with your husband, mm -hmm. but what you also have with your husband is a blog, keeping up with the Darkos. Yeah. So I don't, when, where did that, um, come about and really, um, also kind of touch on, you know, it's interesting for two people who are like, yeah, we're romantically, you know, we're, you know, in a marriage, but then we've also come up with this idea mm -hmm. to a blog. Like, when did that come about? And, um, Ooh, so man, we haven't written in a while, but yeah, we do have that blog and it chronicles essentially, it chronicles the time at which we realized that we were broke, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> technically broke. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, all the way to the time when we had our second child. And so um, that's about maybe a six year span. Um, so that's what the, that's what the blog kind of, kind of chronicles. But so going back to when we realized we were broke now, I mean, technically broke in that our net worth was literally in the negative because we had so much student loan debt. We had $662,000 worth of student loan debt. Um, and pretty much, you know, if, if you have that much debt, you know, your debt to income ratio, eventually, you know. Um, that number amounted to basically in the negative. And we were just like, oh, that's a problem. Um, right. Yeah. So, you know, we started writing about our journey to pay off this debt because that's what we wanted to do. And at the time, we had just gotten married. We had just gotten married maybe six, seven months before that um, and realized, you know, again, that we were broke, but that we wanted to be able to be in good financial footing um, for our own futures. We didn't want to take debt into our retirement. We didn't want to be saddled with it and, you know, eventually start having fights about it. So we said, you know what? We're going to make a plan that we are going to get rid of all of our debt, including our student loan debt. And we ended up doing that actually in three years nice. um, between, yeah, between our, between our permanent jobs and locums we were actually doing permanent and locums jobs at the same time both of us um and so How is that possible? it's possible so you you work you know you work so many days a week at your permanent job and you got a weekend off you that's go it. somewhere else you work there you stack cash that's right come back Pay it off. that's right so we i mean we were working a lot those days we were working a lot for those three years and you know eventually during that time as well um, was when the opportunity came for the locums, um, you know, for the locums business to start funneling doctors through. And that also helped us to kind of finish paying off that debt because that was at the tail end. Like literally we were maybe three, four months away from paying off the debt at that point. Um, and by then we had actually had my first son. So that helped Yes, us. you do. And, and she has two beautiful boys. Yeah. Yeah, she had, and we'll talk, we'll get a little more into that because I know I want to kind of talk about, you know, because that's a lot of hats to wear from mom to, you know, businesswoman to wife, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, you know, as if all that we just talked about is not enough. <laughs> she definitely founded um, pre-med strategies. Yes. So tell us what pre-med strategies is and what, you know, what deficit did you see that you're like, yeah, let me, let me just start this. 
Ooh, child. So <laughs> Listen, talk about let me deficit. Fix, let me fix myself because the way when, when a woman starts with you, child, let me, Ooh, let me child. get closer to the Listen. Well, you know, so let me preface it by saying I have been working with pre-meds since I was probably a first or second year in medical school. Um, I met my mentor right before I applied to medical school. And he said to me, listen, I will help you to get in, um, but you just have to promise me one thing. And that is, you know, you have to help other people get in later on when you're done. And I said, okay. And I have never backed down on that promise. Um, and so years later, um, again, second year of, of med school, reading personal statements, talking to students. Um, I eventually became pre-medical board member of the Student National Medical Association. So doing stuff on a national level, um, chaired that organization as well. Again, just, you know, helping to, you know, promote things for pre-meds, um, but also, you know, realizing that as a black female physician, there weren't a lot of people, you know, who looked like me. Um, in the profession. And so that was the woo child um, in terms of the deficit in that, you know, diversity in medicine is, you know, just, it's a far reach right now. Um, and so when I started pre-med strategies, I started it because I wanted something more official, especially at this point when I was an attending and I wasn't necessarily attached, right, to a specific institution um, you know, that was helping pre-meds to do X, Y, and Z, especially in a very longitudinal way. I wanted to be able to, yeah, talk with them, um, you know, be able to help them with their personal statements, help them with their mock interviews, help them, you know, get into medical school and then beyond. Um, and so that's when I started pre-med strategies. Originally, it started as a coaching program. And now, though, it has evolved more into a career, a, like a, a pre-career development program um, and recruitment opportunity for um, mostly underrepresented uh, students in medicine. So through my pro, so pre-med strategies has a program called MEDEC, which stands for Medical Education Equity, mm -hmm. and it's an app-based program. So I get students right now. We have about three hundred students, three hundred plus students um, on an on an app that I created. Um, and we have, app created? Let me, let me <laughs> add that to the, the, the repertoire. C -O, okay, COO, founder, CEO. <laughs> okay, app, app creator. Okay, welcome to tenants. All right, OBGYN, <laughs> wife, mom. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm running out of space. Give me a second. Um, uh, and then, okay, motivational speaker. Okay, and then app cre I just wanted to make sure you I had so enough funny. space. Because well, I'm running, I'm running out of space. Thank you for that, Dr. Nancy. And listen, yeah, sky just sky is the limit. Just do yes. all the things, <laughs> all the things, and all types of ways, basically. Yes. Um, and so, well, tell me. Actually, that was actually that goes right into my next question. Mm -hmm. Just two things. What would you say to someone that's like just kind of one big piece of advice for someone that's like, I want to start a business. And what advice would you give someone that's like, I want to create an app? Ooh. Yeah. So, you know, first things first is doing both of those things is scary. Right. Like okay. separately. That's right. That <laughs> That's just, it's just scary. And it always is going to be. So when you listen to someone like me or anybody else who has done it, um, especially mega successfully, right? Because I'm still, you know, I'm still in the trenches, you know, still trying to make, you know, all these things come together. But when you look at people who have like created like, you know, mega apps that are just like all over the place, remember that at one point they were just as scared as you. That's the first thing. What if this doesn't work? What if I waste my time? What if I waste my money? What if I, what if you never start? That's what you have to think about. Because if those people never started, you wouldn't be looking at them or hearing them, hearing their stories in the first place. So that you have to work through whatever fear you have and just do it. If it fails, it fails, it's, it's fine. You know, n nothing's going to happen to you if it fails, but you have to do it because that's the only way that it can succeed. So that's, that would be, if that's my main advice, like that, like that's it, is that you have to, you have to work through that fear of failure um, to be able to do that. 
The next thing that I would say is, you know, do your research, you know, figure out what people have done, what people haven't done, what worked, um, what didn't work for people. Just do your research and, you know, try to figure out, okay, how can I do this in a way that will work for me? You know, basically don't try to start big. You ain't Instagram just yet. You know what I'm saying? You you're not gonna be Instagram in Come you know on, Mark in the first Zuckerberg three like put Mark Zuckerberg started small. We we are Dr. Darko and I are old enough to remember when there was yes. no Facebook. Exactly. Thank you. And, and then and then it came into like only college. Exactly. Now folks, nine year olds got Facebook. Exactly. So realize you're not gonna be Instagram from the start, but that doesn't mean you couldn't be, right? Because even Facebook started small. So start small. Don't, well, if I can't get the big grandiose, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to start. Well, you're not going to get the big grandiose from the beginning. Be very realistic about your goals. So right now my app is on version 1.0. That's what it's on. Would I like a version 2.0? Absolutely. But I'm not there yet. Once I grow my, my app to a certain amount, I will go to version 2.0. And I am fine with that. You know why? Because right now I'm helping students. If I said, no, I want to go to version 5.0 before I start, those students wouldn't be helped. So think about the impact that you could have even with the small thing that you're doing. Just and then finally, the third piece of advice I would say is don't be afraid to be creative. You know, you know, those thoughts that people usually have, oh, you know, be cool. What if we did? Yeah, right, yeah. right. Right? Those thoughts. Those thoughts. Keep that same energy. Exactly. Keep that energy. Don't be afraid to be creative because let me tell you, there's probably other people who are having those same thoughts and they just haven't done it. So what if you did do it? You know, so don't be afraid to be creative. Yeah. So then now we've touched on your many accomplishments. <laughs> and to be honest, you know, you're... I mean, I happen to know Dr. Darko. She's very, she's very humble. She's very down to earth, but she's also a powerhouse, obviously. <laughs> but what has been the most, the biggest challenge for you in your journey thus far? I think my biggest challenge, believe it or not, has nothing to do with med school, has nothing to do with any of the businesses. Um, I've been asked this question before and people are always like, really? Um, my biggest challenge was actually becoming a mom. That is my biggest challenge. Um, one, it didn't start out very smooth, right? right? So we tried to have children, couldn't have children, did IVF for two and a half years. Literally, I'm on the road driving back and forth because where I lived was so far out in the boonies that I oh, literally wow. had to drive four hours away <gasps> to be able to go and see an IVF doctor. Oh yeah, we did this for two and a half years. I was on in rest stops injecting myself. <laughs> Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. And none of it worked. No, it never worked till this day. IVF never worked. So after it didn't work, uh, my husband and I at that point, actually my husband had told me, he goes, we were working permanent uh, positions at the time in Pennsylvania. And he says, you need to quit your job. And I was like, what do you mean I need to quit my job? And he's like, you need to quit your job. You're too stressed. You're driving back and forth. Before we do our next cycle, you need to quit your job. So I thought about it. And one, on one of my many drives back and forth from Pennsylvania to New York, I thought to myself, you know, I have spent a good part of my life getting up to this point, helping people to grow their families. And now I want to grow my own. Right. And I can't even give myself the time to do that. And so I thought about what my husband said. And I was like, I'm going to quit my job. And so I put in my three months notice. And during, during the three months, I did not do any IVF activity. The only thing I did do was actually, I did acupuncture and I did massage and I alternated those back and forth for about three months. Um, and lo and behold, um, I, we go to start the first IVF cycle. And before we start, we find out I'm pregnant. Oh. <laughs> Surprise! Surprise! No more IVF. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I'm just go, just not gonna give you thousands and thousands of dollars. Thanks a lot. Yep, never mind. Yeah. NBS. Right, right. Exactly. Like, thanks. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That's yeah. so awesome. Yeah. I think we often underestimate the the beating that we're accustomed to getting yes. to to um putting our bodies through 
And yeah. I think we've we don't realize how much we've normalized that. Yeah. You know, and I yeah. think um oftentimes we underestimate the impact of that. Yep. To the point Absolutely. where sometimes even when you relax and you're not, you're just like, okay. Right. So is that what we're doing with meditating? Great. This gives me a perfect opportunity to start my mental to-do list. Okay, so on Monday, yep. I'm gonna Exactly. What what? Exactly. So I, you know, parking myself, parking, although I was working, but not having the extra added stress of, I got to drive. I got to take this shot. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to, I think that definitely helps me. And then giving myself at least an hour a week to be able to relax and do something for my body during those three months, I think definitely helped. You know, for me, it was, it was necessary. Um, and so I, I think I truly, truly attribute that to, you know, having my body be able to do what it did. Um, and believe it or not, same thing. We repeated kind of the, almost, almost exactly the same thing. Um, with my second son, we did an IVF cycle completely like the pregnancy test didn't even come back positive. With that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. You're like, it okay. Was, yeah. It's just resting during that time. So at that point, yes, I was, I was at, at that point, I was more so of a stay at home mom ish. Um, I was still working locums, but mostly home with my son. And then I, I did an IVF cycle that didn't work. Um, so we were like, ah, let's just go to Ghana. So we, <laughs> we went to Ghana, did a mission trip, um, came back. And then a couple of months later, you know, I, I did um, an acupuncture. I actually did two acupuncture treatments, um, you know, just to kind of regulate some things. And then all of a sudden I was like, hmm, not feeling normal. <laughs> My second off. son. <laughs> exactly. Oh, a baby's growing. Got yeah, it. baby. Yeah, it's a baby. Oh, okay, that'll, that'll do That's it. it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's so great. You actually, you mentioned Ghana. Yeah. I'd be remiss if I didn't, you know, mention the work yeah. that you guys have been doing in Ghana. Um, mm -hmm. As Dr. Darko mentioned, she is both Dr. and Mrs. Darko. Yeah. Her husband <laughs> is a is a surgeon, yes. um, and he is from Ghana. And mm -hmm. Dr. Darko, like a woman after my own heart, is from Haiti. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is a Haitian Sisters Unite podcast, That's right? And and so you guys have been doing mission work in Ghana for how many how many years now? So we, so my first mission trip in Ghana was in 2011, I believe. Yeah, 2011. Um, we've been back and forth probably a total of about five times, um, you know, give or take, you know, being pregnant, having kids, things like that. Um, my husband is actually slated to go in March, actually in a, in a month um, to go to Ghana. So yeah, we've been doing it since about 2011. Um, we go with a group called International Healthcare Volunteers, which was started um, by uh, two of my mentors who are who are actually OBGYNs and they are married. Um, and they've been doing this trip since 2002. So this is their 20th anniversary um, of International Healthcare Volunteers. Yeah. That's great. And then one thing too we want to mention is doing locums allows you to be, you yes. know, go to Ghana yes. for whatever period of time you'd want in between contracts. Correct. Absolutely. And that's what we love about doing locums and, you know, why we continue to do it today. Um, it really just allows us that flexibility. You know, I kind of mentioned that I'm like a stay at home. I call myself like a stay at home OBGYN, <laughs> stay at home doctor, um, because I still work, but I work one weekend a month. My husband works about one week or so um, between one week and 10 days out of the month. And then the rest of the time, we're able to do things with our families, you know, with, you know, with my mom, my dad, his mom, his dad, um, our children. And so it really allows us to live a much more fulfilling life uh, that I think that we would not be able to live had we, you know, gone the traditional route. And that, that works for us. And I, and I love you saying that um, because the more important note is you have to do what works for you. But the first step is figuring out what that is and um, deciding, hey, right. this is what works for me. Do the work. This is what works for me. And then go get it, like the uh, like the Mary Mary song says. So then with all that said, right. um, exactly. what 
what is the next step for Dr. Garker? Like, what is, I know. Well, you know, I'm not sure what the next step is. I know, I think, so I, I think I'm in expansion mode. Okay. Right? That not, does sound I'm like not a great in, video game. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'm in expansion mode. I'm not in an additive mode. I don't think that there's anything at this point um, that I'd like to add to the plate. I think I just got to make the plate a little bit bigger to make the things that we're doing more sustainable. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, doing more stuff with pre-med strategies, growing the app, um, growing my husband's podcast, um, things like that, you know, figuring out, you know, what the, you know, what we're going to do with our children in terms of, you know, their growth and their development um, and creating opportunities for them, seeing what they're good at and really helping them to excel in those things. So I think I'm just more in an expansion mode than I am in a, you know, what's next in terms of adding um, to the plate. Got it. So that makes sense. And what, um, and I'll kind of end with this. What are you most proud of? Oh, what am I most proud of? Funny, I got asked this question too. And honestly, the thing that I think I'm most proud of is actually choosing the person that I chose to marry. I think, I think that I know it sounds sappy, whatever, but I say sap. I say sap. We like sap. What's wrong with sap? I know I'm not a sappy person, so that's why I'm like, I know it sounds sappy. <laughs> but um, it truly, I think, choosing the right partner in life, I think, really makes a difference in how your life, you know, how your life unfolds. Um, and I think you you really have to be very deliberate about that person, about the person that you choose. Um, and and think about what this person wants in life, what you want in life, and what you want together. And does that does that mesh? And if it does mesh, then what potentially could it look like going forward? Um, you know, I for me, I know a lot of women will be like, I'm most proud of my children. I'm like, yeah, but I wouldn't have those children if it wasn't for my husband. Um, and so, you know, for us our legacy is our children. So together we have one legacy and that, that is, you know, our children. Um, and that is what propels us to do all of the things that we do together. So. I love it. And that's a, what a wonderful way to wrap up our episode. This has been like a power packed, inspirational girl on fire type of episode. And I absolutely, absolutely love it. So I want to thank Dr. Darko. Thank you so much, Dr. Renee Bonnie Darko, for coming to the thank podcast today. Thank you so today. much, Dr. Nancy Joseph, for having me on. I really, really, really want to thank you and tell you I appreciate all that you're doing. I'm so appreciative that you even thought of me to come on to your show. This is a huge honor for me. So thank you so much. You're going to start. You're going to start. You're going to make me make bad faces. All right, all right. I'm not sappy. That's all right. <laughs> As she said, she's like, I'm not a savvy person. My husband, I want to say, thank you. I <laughs> do cry at the drop of a dime, though. <laughs> you what? Right, yeah, exactly. At the drop of a dime. Um, but so, thank you so, so much, Dr. Darko, for coming on our podcast today. Thank you, everyone who um tuning in. Thank you so much for your support. Definitely um, make sure if you're listening on audio, uh, let you know that there is a video version um, up on YouTube. Um, and in general, go ahead and check out our other episodes too. And in the meantime, again, thank you for tuning in and make sure you stay safe, stay healthy and be blessed. See you next time. Peace.